Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Frédéric Nacle. I'm the Cortex SC Director for EMEA, and I'm today with my uh, partner in crime, Jesus Diaz Barrero, who is uh, a Senior SC Manager for Cortex in Southern. I'm excited to be uh, introducing and talking virtually with Kevin Mitnick today. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and talking virtually with Kevin, who the reputation of the world's most famous hacker precedes him. Kevin is now CEO of Meeting Security and his global ghost team of ethical hackers maintain a 100% successful record on their ability to penetrate the security of any system they are paid to hack into using a combination of technical exploits and social engineering. Also in his role of chief hacking officer of No Before, he endorsed and produced the world's first security awareness training and platform bearing his name. Please, let's virtually welcome the world's authority on hacking and social engineering. Welcome to Kevin Mitnick and thanks for being there. Thank you, Fred. It's fantastic to be here. By the way, I'm live from Auckland, New Zealand. It's now 3.05 in the morning. I, you know, I work hacker hours, so this is perfect for me. So, so exciting. This is a you know, I, I, I'm really going to enjoy this event because it's a lot different from what I'm used to doing when I'm doing uh, typical keynotes where you guys, you, uh, Fred and, you know, Jesus are going to play the uh, blue teamers. And I'm going to talk about specific ways that uh, we compromise systems, you know, from, you know, when we're doing offensive pen penetration testing and red teaming work. Wow. Thanks a lot, Kevin. So, so glad to be with you guys. Thanks a lot, uh, Fred, as well. Kevin, just to start challenging you a bit, I'm not sure if this is a, a, a kind, the kind of the introduction that Fred was, was uh, mentioning. He said that you guys are getting 100% uh, penetration rate uh, when you are trying to do your stuff. Is this a marketing thing? Uh, we should always trust the hacker. Can you please give us some more details about what this means? And also some of the techniques that in your humble opinion are the most important ones or the more significant that we are typically using in order to put penetration so that we get things started if it's, if it's fine for you. Yeah, sure. So it's kind of qualified. Uh, so when we're talking about 100% success rate, that's when the client allows us to use social engineering and scope of the test. And that's where we're doing pretext calls. That's where we're doing, you know, um, phishing attacks and this sort of thing. Um, typically how we, you know, begin our assessments is really conducting meticulous OSINT, open source intelligent work. We're looking at data breaches like SpyCloud for, uh, you know, breach credentials that are aggregated. We're not really looking for credentials most of the time. We're looking for the people's patterns and choosing credentials because that might be useful later, for example, in a password spray. Like, for example, if there's one organization that has a common credential that's used multiple times, that might be a good one to try. We look for the IP net blocks of the target, of course. We're looking for credentials that might be in GitHub or, you know, or keys. You know, so we're doing a lot of passive analysis. We're looking at Shodan. We're looking at, has this company acquired any other companies? Because that might be the weak link. I was working on a recent assessment where the company in the United States, the headquarters had just acquired a company overseas in Asia and the Asian company was the weakest link. That's how we're able to break into the network. So, you know, we, we kind of do this, you know, more in depth analysis, but typically what we're doing is we're looking at external network services. Is there anything to exploit? Is there anything that requires authentication? Did the client make a mistake and leave like port 445 SMB open? You know, you know, for example, you know, back if we're in a dated, you know, if we're going back, you know, maybe six months, you know, could we exploit uh, internal blue, you know, or any other types of stuff? Then where we get a, a lot of success, um, Jesus is on password sprays. Even though it's so simple, what we do is we'll, We'll look on the website for usernames. We'll scrape information from LinkedIn and we'll acquire what are legitimate, for example, usernames in the environment. That's why it's so important not to use real usernames, by the way, in Active Directory. And then we'll spray the environment with a common credential. And surprisingly, you know, out of the number of security assessments we do, we're, I'd say we get like a 75% hit rate. We look at in external web applications. You know, could we find a remote code execution vulnerability? Uh, when we're close, when you have I mean, close proximity I tests. The interruption, um, because I think yeah. that you mentioned something super interesting for the audience regarding the password spray 
and the possibility to compromise credentials. How, guys, are you are you trying to hide your operations and, for instance, uh, try to avoid being detected or blocked because you are constantly repeating trying the same pass a different password for the same user? What what kind of techniques or approaches are you using? If you may share that with the audience, I think it would be great. Sure, like with Office three sixty five, for example, Microsoft has you know technologies in place to you know detect password sprays. Typically, they're looking at hey, is there a or is there login attempts across the environment coming from a particular IP address? So what we do is we'll use AWS, for example, uh, to rotate our IPs. So every password attempt is coming attempt is coming from a different IP address. So it's very you know difficult to detect, um, and it, it works extremely well. And in some and, and this also works like for targets like Okta, for example, when companies are using single sign-on, where we could target LDAP in Okta that's you know, exposed and do the same thing. As long as we have a good pool of IP addresses that we could rotate, we could usually stay under the radar. But the downside is it's a slow attack. What we have to do is really slow it down because the faster it goes, the more likely you're gonna be detected. And then of course, phishing, you know, the easiest way in to every target where we have the 100% success rate, we'll either do phishing, we'll do pretext calls, you know, and we know the success of pretext calls, like, you know, when Twitter was hacked, you know, what, what, six, nine months ago by this kid in Tampa calling up employees at home pretending to be from the IT department. And then we even go after third party providers. So if there's a subsidiary company of the oh. target client, we'll actually look at those particular companies, identify their net blocks, for example, look at what network services are there, look at what web services that could potentially be exploited. Now, there's one attack that we can't do because we don't have permission you know, which is very, you know, important to obviously consider these days when layering your defense is supply chain attacks, right? So just with the solar winds attack. So if you have a true threat actor out there, they might go to the extent of compromise, you know, looking what vendors does the target use and then trying to compromise that vendor to put in some malicious code that will be deployed to customers like you. So these are the kind of things we look at. We kind of look at everything that's potentially out there to exploit. And of course that even widens, we have much greater attack surface if we can go physically to the target company where we can do physical attacks or wireless attacks, then that attack surface is much, is much larger. So one of our goal today is, is to try to uh, be the nice guy while you will be the bad guys, uh, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we would like to come back a little bit uh, uh, before that on the good habits that we could have on security, which is mean for us something that we call the zero trust network. And uh, if I may share that with everybody, so here it is. So basically a lot of people think that the security is something really simple, where you have an untrust side and a trust side. The challenge that we've got with this kind of thing that feel that someone's internally could be trust that exactly what you are doing usually Kevin and that's exactly where you usually land so in the well, trust I have the face of trust <laughs> I have the face, the face of, of trust, trust so I always get it <laughs> <laughs> completely true and um, of course this kind of concept is uh, for us um, to uh, completely block and change because it came from a previous age and now if we relate it to security something that we should do which is put in place a zero trust network. So everybody should have an implicit uh, knowledge about what they are able to do and what they should do. Means that if during that time, you try to access to something else, of course you should be authentic authenticate and you, every time that you are doing an action on a server or something else, we should validate what this access should be. By example, here, if I move again, that's related to the fact that we need to validate the users with strong authentication, including the admin. I know that usually the admin like to be the ones who have the less security because it's bother them. Like it could bother every, any kind of user, which is usually the challenge. Verify every time what is the user device, even if it's corporate device, check if their integrity and the, if there is sense that they are logged now at this specific place because two hours before they were connected by example from New Zealand, <laughs> something could be a little bit more challenging. And of course, uh, be uh, sure that the access to the applications that they try to have access to are legitimate. And every time keep a control about how the 
minimum requirement to access to the application to let the user do their job, nothing else. And of course, have a continuous scan about the activities that they are doing and try to have a kind of learning about what they are doing usually to see if there is anything which could not be um, uh, usual in their daily job. Okay, so thanks a lot, Fred. So guys, moving forward, if we want to talk a bit uh, about what are the uh, specific stuff that, uh, that Cortex uh, can do in order to, to work in this uh, uh, zero trust framework that Fred was very nicely presenting to you guys. Basically, those are the four pillars, right? That we are trying to, to work into. First one is, of course, uh, reducing the attack surface so that Kevin needs to work a lot during the night, a lot of, a lot of nights in order to, in Oakland, uh, in order to make uh, his life a bit more difficult, right? So this, this is basically reducing the bullseye. Of course, we are always talking about prevention, trying to prevent everything we can prevent. It's, it's of course, much better. 100% prevention, unfortunately, everyone knows uh, that is, is not possible to offer. So in many cases, we need to, to detect stuff. And for that, it's crucial that we have data. We are running analytics. When we are talking about analytics, guys, we are basically talking about machine learning, detecting baselines, behaviors, and trying to, to find the, the leftovers, the anomalies there. And of course, finally, run automation, right? So this is the only, the only approach that uh, here from Cortex at Palo Alto Networks we are taking in order to provide you guys with uh, proactive security ag against this kind of stuff. Now, if we if we take a bit of, of uh, details into the picture, uh, when we are talking about prevention first, we are talking about the, the XDR solution, which we are able to deploy on the on the on the agents. And um, when we are talking about everything that we are not uh, possibly uh, able to to prevent, and we need to detect, we are using exactly the same agent. If you can move forward, please, Fred. Uh, and uh, and um, this is crucial as well, and um, uh, because it will allow us to investigate everything. And finally, um, you need to learn, right? Uh, lesson learns. Uh, every time you are doing something, you need to learn. Every time you're getting an incident, you need to automate the response. This is what we are doing with our SOAR solution, XOR coming back from the, the MISTO days. And uh, not just automating uh, the response, but also getting smarter, right? With every incident, learning with uh, everything. Last but not least, um, we also believe uh, in Cortex, and this is the last piece, and this is what the way that we are integrating stuff, guys, that you need to understand also how is your uh, security posture from the from the external point of view, right? And, and Kevin before, and, and now in, in a minute, he will be also talking very nicely about this. It's always trying to understand first what's going on from the from the outside, right? So what, what an, an attack surface management solution is trying to, to, to understand is making a picture of how you are looking uh, uh, from an external perspective, just the same way that an, an attacker, a real attacker, and not a, and not a, a, a pen tester, will be doing. Right? That's that's the goal. So this is the this is the solution. Um, at the end of the day, and we will be talking uh, uh, later on on the on the detail attack that Kevin will be presenting on each and every module. Uh, maybe now it's time for Kevin to go back and uh, tell us about your nice and, and detailed story. I'm sure that the people will love it because it's kind of Ocean's Eleven. So please go ahead. Yeah, I love doing the penetration testing or red teaming that, you know, we get to be like Ocean's Eleven operatives. And, you know, just like you said, Fred, it's all about layering your defensive technologies. That's, you know, a really critical point that you don't have a single point of failure. But anyway, I, I have to tell you this story because I, I enjoyed it so much. It's one of my favorite uh, red teaming exercises where a company, a very large retailer, they had retail shops in Europe, in the United States, and our job, our, you know, our you know, engagement was to not only do red teaming remotely, but try to physically get it and get physical access to the facility so we can compromise IT assets. And I love physical pen testing because of the danger. Now, of course we get get out of jail free letters with it, but can you imagine, you know, I'm pen testing a client and I get caught and the police are there and I hand them this letter you know, that sign from the uh, client and they ask me for my identity and I give them my driver's license and they run it and they go, this letter doesn't mean anything to us. We're taking you down, right? Because of my background. So I certainly never want to get caught because of the inconvenience. So I really strive to do it right the first time. So in this particular test, we did a lot of reconnaissance. You know, reconnaissance is not only done by pen testing teams, but also by true bad actors. And this particular retail uh, establishment, had a, you had an opportunity to meet with their sales staff in like in a closed office. And one of our re persons on the recon team went in and this client was using Macs, Mac endpoints, and they had 
nice, those nice iMacs in the office. So what we did is we scheduled to set up an appointment. And during the appointment time, we, during the, the time that we're actually in the appointment, the cell phone rings, and this is all pre-planned, and it's a call that I'm receiving on my phone. And I said, oh, I, I tell the sales guy, I said, oh, this is a call from my doctor about some, you know, very serious blood test. Can you do me a favor? Can you give me five minutes, you know, just close the door and leave your office? And, you know, the guy wants to make a sale. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. You know, just let me know when you're ready. And I've already seen he's logged into his uh, iMac. First thing I do is I plug in a wireless key logger back uh, in the back of his iMac, but he can't see it from his point of view. It's facing the wall. So he'll never see it unless he looks behind the iMac. And then I took a Teensy device. It's basically a hid device that injects keystrokes. And this guy was already logged in to his Mac. So as soon as I plug it in, it simply injects keystrokes and dropped the payload. And what this payload did was be able to, you know, connect back to our C2 that was actually sitting in Linode, which is a cloud service. And um, so that was essentially how we were able to compromise that Mac. Yeah, Go ahead, sorry. Fred, what were you going to say? Yeah, I, I have a question. I understand that this kind of, of, of command and control traffic that you were able to establish through the through this Tensi device should have generated some kind of alerts or even even some blocks on, on the on the perimeter system firewalls or whatever these guys had. How did you how did you avoid to how how were you able to hide those those activities so that they didn't detect you and they didn't block you, of course? Well, don't forget a lot of EBRs or AV products that are out there are not going to detect keystrokes, like stuff coming in, you know, kind of through the front door, so to speak. They should detect, you know, the payloads that we dropped. And what we did is we set up our own launch agent. We set up a, a, a cron job in the context of that non-privileged user. And we the communications over the network was over SSL. We put everything through an SSL tunnel to our C2 that was sitting in Linode, which is a you know cloud service like AWS, for example. So that's how we were able to evade their. EDR at the time. And they were using one of the new generation EDRs. It wasn't like they were not using any sort of AV on their Mac endpoints. Okay, I understand that you were using uh, valid certificates as well, right? So that uh, the, it was not generating any kind of alerts, right? Yeah, valid certificates, absolutely, right? So it looked like real legitimate tra traffic. So unless they're gonna do SSL termination, they're not gonna see what's in the tunnel. What might've been a clue is you have a persistent connection to some IP address out there that's in the cloud that doesn't really make sense to be up that long. Um, that's coming from a launch agent. So that's that's an indicator of compromise. That something strange is going on there. So the type of traffic that would have to be, you know, again, the traffic is you know kind of concealed in an SSL tunnel. So once we got the connection back to our C2, and don't forget, I had to obviously close the loose ends and leave the office, and I still have other people working with me on this assignment. Now we have a shell in the context of the user from Mac OS, right? And now we, you know, we look to see what we could do to elevate. You know, we're looking, we're kind of looking in every directory on the Mac, you know, the desktop, the downloads, and this sort of thing to see if we could find any juicy data. And of course, the user did not have sudo rights to elevate to root. So fortunately for us, not good for the company is we're able to exploit a heap-based buffer overflow that allowed us to uh, corrupt kernel memory. And then we're able to elevate to root on the Mac. So now we have, you know, and this is going towards a particular reason of why we're doing this. What my goal was in compromising this user is getting their credentials, one, but also getting access to the system keychain on the endpoint because all these iMacs in the business were always using wireless. So we wanted to exfiltrate the system keychain, exfiltrate the system key, which is the slash var and slash DB on a Mac, and then be able to decrypt the system keychain offline and get the wireless credentials. So once we get the wireless credentials, now I can connect to the network. And very interesting, Fred, so this company had a bunch of retail stores. So the ones that, you know, the ones I targeted were next door to restaurants. So if I can get their access to their PSK, PSK the pre-shared key, I'm not gonna sit outside on a laptop. That's very suspicious. I was able to actually sit you know, in a restaurant for hours and hours and hours pen testing the network you know, in the comfort of you know, uh, you know, sitting at the bar, so to speak. So the first thing I, you know, we do is when we're testing is you know, let's scan the, the local subnet. Let's see what devices are out there that we could compromise. And in that particular case, we found a lot of Cisco IP phone, you know, Cisco phones. We found several different printers. And what was interesting 
is we can extract the phone directory from the Cisco phones. We could access the printers because they, because they're on the inside of this network, they never bothered to change their credentials. So we could log in with the default administrative credentials that were put in there by the manufacturer, which is, you know, which you'll see that was a huge mistake. But the most interesting part is I was also able to get the manager of that retail establishment, their personal cell phone number, which was important. I wanted to get the employees direct cell phone numbers at home because that was gonna be part of another a branch of this uh, security assessment. Hey, Kevin, um, why uh, getting access to the manager's phone was really relevant for you? Okay, so I'm gonna digress here because this is my favorite part of the test. So this is where did a physical test. So I wanted to get the manager's phone because Previously, when he went into the establishment and saw they were using hit access card readers and on the hit access card readers that any customer could see was a label. And the label was the name of the alarm company that actually installed it. And the, uh, the access control devices were, you know, HID. I'm sure everybody probably that's watching this event is familiar with uh, HID because they're, you know, they're one of the largest access, uh, uh, access device companies in the world. But in any event, um, so we saw that the manufacturer was this, was this particular company. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to see if there was a way into this establishment by getting through, by stealing their access credentials. In the final analysis, you couldn't get in the front door, but if you had the access card, you could basically get into any door within the place. So what I wanted to do is be able to call the manager posing as the alarm company because I wanted to trick him into giving me particular information. And in this particular case, call them up, I spoofed the number of the alarm company. So it's coming on the cell phone, it's showing the 800 number for the alarm company. And I told him, hey, this is you know, Paul Davis. You know, I'm, I'm in the uh, knock center of the alarm company. At 3.30 a.m. last night, we had an alarm trip on this particular door on the second level. And uh, we didn't call the police because none of the motion sensors went off but we probably want to send one of our alarm te technicians out to take a look at it. And he goes, oh, hold on, hold on. Let me, and he put me on hold and he went actually to go check the door. And he was looking at it, obviously. And he came back on, on the phone. Uh, I don't know why he didn't bring his cell phone with him. It was weird, but whatever. He came back and he goes, uh, everything looks fine. And I said, well, we should get, we should go down there. We should clean the contacts. We should actually investigate because the last thing we want is an alarm event and where we have to dispatch the police. He says, no problem, you can send one of your technicians anytime. And I say, listen, we only have availability probably in the last hour, you guys are open. So we're probably gonna send somebody there. And then I told him, I said, listen, one thing we need to do is clear the event. And what my objective was to get his pin code because whenever you're, you disable an alarm outside of hours, they ask for a pin code of somebody that's authorized to be in. And I told him for security reasons, he should never reveal the pin code, you know, verbally over the phone. So we've set up a special system for that. If you need to clear the event with the alarm company, please go ahead and touch tone in with DTMF, put in your code and, the, and the, it will clear the event. So he does it, right? He actually touch tones in the, his pin. And of course we're recording the call. And then I tell him, hey, that didn't work. You know, I'm sorry, are, are you really so-and-so? And he goes, no, yeah, I am. I said, please try it again. Reason I had to do it twice is to make sure I had the right code, that I didn't have an error. So of course I closed up that loose end. And then at the same time in parallel, we have two guys that are actually in the retail establishment and they are walking around with these long range uh, HID card. Uh, this is an R90, so it's a long range reader. So I'll read a card from like three feet away. One, 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 second, problem one, one second, where are you getting this from? Where are you getting? You are going, you are going to a shop and you are purchasing one of those. How do how do you, how do you get in one of these long range readers? Well, off of e eBay. And then we, we <laughs> modify the, the internals of it to do things we want, like say things to, you know, I have it where I have an implant in here where I could look at the, the badge, uh, the facility ID and the badge ID over wireless. So it's, it's quite cool. So the problem was this particular company had what they call an I-class elite reader. So they have an encryption key that's in the reader that is assigned to that particular alarm company. So the problem is a standard reader would work. So I had a really brilliant uh, colleague who's an engineer build me a device. This is actually it, uh, Jesus and Fred, you can look at the back of this. 
So what this device does is if you hold it up to a HID iClass Elite Reader, it has an SD card here. What it does is it does train, you know, it basically does card reads about a thousand of them or more to the reader and it exploits a vulnerability where it writes data onto this SD card. And then we can do offline analysis of that data and crack the encryption key. Then what we do is we load that encryption key into the R90 reader. So at the end of the day, we have these backpacks and we're walking through the store talking to the sales reps and we're unbeknownst to them, we're stealing their credentials because their proximity card is close enough to our backpack we're reading their credentials. So we read like over 25 of them, which was great. <laughs> so then um, you always look for the, obviously the least, uh, uh, the number that's the lowest value because that pr person probably has the most seniority. So now we had the pin code, we had the access card, and now we wanna, you know, now we wanna use it. But the old, one thing we were missing was the alarm code. How are we gonna get in the building after hours? So what I did is I showed up, you know, around, 45 minutes before closing, I'm in my suit. I went to their Facebook page of the alarm company and they had a beautiful logo of their uh, of the company and I laminated the card at FedEx office. So <laughs> if I'm wearing this, it looks like the alarm company's card. I went and downloaded the I, um, sorry, the, uh, the app from the app store, Apple. And when you open up the app, it showed you know the logo of the alarm company. I show up in my suit. And I walk in, I have my iPad, you can clearly see the logo. I have this dangling from my hip. Uh, and uh, I walk in, I said, hey, this is so-and-so, forgot what name I used with the alarm company, gave the name, I'm obviously not saying it here. And, uh, and immediately one of the ladies, you know, talked to me and she brought in a crew of people that go, who are you? We've never seen you before. So I have like three people surrounding me. And, um, and they're like grilling me like, never seen you before. Who do you work for? Like, uh, who did you talk to? I said, listen, our knock center talked to your manager earlier today and he's already given us authorization to send a technician out. I'm the technician. I'm on loan from this different area. So that's why, you know, uh, you haven't seen me before. And then I thought, okay, they're, they're suspicious. I got to build trust and credibility. So they had a door 30 feet away uh, that was armed with an access card reader. So what I said is come over here. I said, come over Let's walk over to this door and let me show you something. So they, they follow me over and I take my proximity card. I hold it up. It turns green. Door pops. It clicks. And the door opens. I said, obviously, I'm with the alarm company or my key went work. And they go, you're right. Sorry. You're right. And, and, they, and they, everybody walks away except the one lady. And she goes, how can I help you? I said, where's our equipment? She goes, it's downstairs. She walks me downstairs. I use the same proximity card to open the room where all the alarm equipment was. I said, let me sit in here for about 10 to 15 minutes. She shuts the door, she leaves. I'm taking photos for the report and uh, acting like I'm tweaking stuff. I go back to her 10 minutes later. I said, okay, I had to adjust the system. There were some issues. Let's go ahead and test the alarm. So I walk up to where the alarm panel was and I place my body very close to the panel where it would be impolite for asking me to move out of the way. So then I hold my iPad out from a POV that she could see the back. She can't see what I'm doing. And I'm like swiping and typing, like as if I'm doing something, which I wasn't. And I said, go ahead and put in the uh, arm code because it was already disarmed. And she types it in. I can clearly see what it was, the four digits. I said, something's wrong. That didn't work. And I'm swiping into, I go, do it again. And she does it again. Of course, I had to do it twice to make sure I got the right code. And then, of course, now I have the alarm code. I tie up the loose ends. I thank her very much. I said, if you have any problems, please call. And we're out the door. <clears throat> Later on that night, we go to actually make entry into the into the building. And uh, as soon as we uh, get to the front door where we're going to actually do lock picking to break into the facility, the, the problem was there's too much foot traffic facing the street. And we didn't want to obviously cause it, uh, you know, cause a lot of attention, you know, so the cops are called. But what we realized is they actually had an elevator that was used for handicap to be able to get into the store because they had stairs. So what we ended up doing <clears throat> is getting the fireman's keys for that city. So we got the master key that all the firemen have. So we were able to get to the elevator, control that elevator, open it up onto the floor where that keypad was, put in the alarm code, disable the alarm. I call up the alarm company spoofing the manager's cell phone number. And I say, hey, we're in here doing some inventory at night. My pin code is yada, 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 the one that, you know, I was able to get him to touch down in. And they said, yeah, fine, you're cleared. 
And now we're in the facility. So now we're backdooring all the endpoints. They had all Mac endpoints. They didn't have File Vault 2 enabled. So we're able to boot in single user mode, which you know, gave us root access. And then I was able to use the Teensy device to deploy my payloads. So now at the end of, you know, when we left the store, we had a C2 that basically had several connections from a lot of their Macs. And then that was another foothold that we had on kind of their internal network so we could go ahead and further the pen test. So I sorry I digressed there. So let's get back to wow, where I was on the wireless network. I'm, I'm sitting in this restaurant and I'm now connected. I, I have their PSK. And now I, you know, I find the phones, I find printers, I connect to the printers, realize their default credentials. And one of the printers, we go into the administrator menu, I mean the menu, and we see that it connects, they, they have a credential to connect to SendGrid. So it's a SendGrid um, a host name, it's the username, like an email address, it's the password. And I go, wow, we wanna get that. Maybe that will give us some intelligence that we could use to further the objectives. So I tried, we tried to look at this printer to see if we could like somehow reveal what the credential was and it didn't seem to be easy to do. So what I decided to do was I noticed since I was an administrator on the printer, I could simply just change the host name. So what I did is I set up an SMTP server out there in the cloud that would log the username and password when you connected to the SMTP server. So what I had to do was actually create a fault because why this was programmed into the printer, if there was a fault, it would email through SendGrid uh, an alert to the IT team that there's an out of paper condition. Mm -hmm. So what I had to do was run, I ran the printer out of paper, it sent the email, well, it connected to my SMTP server and I got the creds to SendGrid. Now the SendGrid cred, it was like a gold mine of information because what I was able to do at that point was, was they had certain uh, internal IT operations email accounts and I was able to set it up so SendGrid, so all the emails would be copied to another email address that belonged to me. And it was on a lookalike domain. So if they actually, looked at the SendGrid account, it would stand out as anything suspicious. So essentially anytime IT operations got an email, I got a copy of it. So then I was thinking, could I do a password reset? And so I knew they used Confluence. So I basically just tried resetting the administrator password to Confluence and lo and behold, I got a copy of the password reset email. And I was like, awesome. So I actually reset the password to the admin account of Confluence and I'm in Confluence, right? So now I have administrator rights in Confluence and Confluence in this particular organization, again, was a, is, is a, a gold mine of information because it was like a wiki, a wiki of all the IT operations, all the different IT assets they had in the company. And it was almost like just a roadmap to continue. Vivian, uh, excuse me, one question from my side, uh, I, two questions. Yeah. So you, you made the kind of uh, man in the middle attack, even if it's not exactly that with, uh, with this printer. And I wouldn't call it man in the middle. I'd call it more like a redirect. A redirect, so yes. They, they meant to connect to you know, SendGrid, but they got the Kevin Mitnick version of SendGrid, which uh, they probably didn't want. And so, then I was able to intercept the password. Of course, and I, I, I reconfigured it back you know, once you sure. know, I was able to intercept the credential. And uh, did you, you have another question? Do you think that in, in this specific use case, the uh, IoT device, which was a printer, was the weaknesses of the uh, of the company or it was more general, it means uh, everything that you did before, because here with this device that you could uh, hack, finally you get a lot of information. I think it was pivotal um, in, in you know, furthering the objectives, but I think the mistake was default admin credentials mm -hmm. on the printer. I mean, when you're on the inside, you know, a, you should still set a, a complex credential. So I'd say, yeah, IoT of a device for sure and bad password management would be uh, definitely it. So at that point we're on Confluence and I'm spending hours and hours reading a bunch of documents and understanding their infrastructure, understanding how they manage things. And then of course I search for the word VPN and immediately pops up the instructions for employees to connect to the uh, VPN, right? And so now I need the credentials. Remember I was root on that Mac that I planted the uh, 
the um, the mm -hmm. implant, and then I had the key, the wireless key logger on there. Well, I never went to get the key log. So what I had, I had to go back to the target location, and next to the target location was another like bakery restaurant, and I had to connect with my iPhone to the wireless device, which was a wireless device, so I could retrieve the key log. And the funny thing is, guys, the only place this would work is in the bathroom because that was it shared the wall to that office. So I actually had to sit there in the stall to, to retrieve the key log, you know, which wasn't a pleasant thing, but at least I was able to get it done. And in the key log, of course, was the target's credentials. So now I was able to, you know, now I had the uh, SSL VPN. I had this target's credentials. I'm root on our Mac. I simply try it. You know, I'm expecting, you know, I'm worried because I'm worried that when I try to log in, it's going to do a 2FA push. And as soon as that happens, somebody's going to get a notice on their phone and they're going to call IT and it's going to be, hey, you're detected. So, but I took the chance and amazingly, I was logged in, guys. No 2FA. Really? No second factor authentication. Yeah. Like, they don't yeah, have like it was. Well, as, as yeah, it was a, before, working on the identity part, is, I think it's one of the most important ones, right? Right. It's a, 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 and, and some of the audience guys here in the chat, I've been seeing that they were mentioning many times like, around the importance, right, of having multi-factor. Maybe Kevin, to, to challenge you a bit, what, what would you have done in, in the case that this company would have uh, a, a second factor authentication, a dual factor authentication for this VPN? Are there still any chances for you to try to, to bypass that connection? What would be your approach there? If you may, if you may yeah. come to your audience. Yeah, absolutely. What I would have done is I would have, uh, pre I would have done, a, I would have made a pretext call to the user to connect uh, to connect to the VPN and try to log in, saying we're you know trying to make sure VPN access works for you, that sort of thing. And then after the person authenticates, I'm going to steal their their uh, session cookies. Now, of course, on a Mac, if you're using Chrome, the safe storage key for Chrome is in the keychain. So how am I going to get to the keychain? Well, I have her credentials or his credentials, so I'm able to unlock the keychain, get access to the key that's used to encrypt cookies, used to encrypt credentials then I basically import that into a virtual machine and steal the entire Chrome directory. So now, you know, I'm essentially that person. But now when that person's logged in to like the VPN, I'd be logged in with that person because now I have the session key. So that's a method I'd use if, if it did have 2FA enabled. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So next step, so we're almost done here. Next step was, okay, now I'm on their, now I'm on their internal network. I, I need to find the domain controller because I know they still use Active Directory. Basically, uh, they use Active Directory uh, instead of an LDAP server for, you know, for authentication, to verify authentication. And uh, so I found the domain controller and then I queried LDAP because I have an authenticated account. And the first thing I did was query who the domain admins were, who were the enterprise admins, who were the target uh, targets that uh, I could potentially attack. I found several service accounts, tried a few passwords for each of the service accounts that didn't pan out, but I wanted to be careful because if you, you know, if you did five or more uh, tries, you're going to potentially create a security event. It's going to lock out an account. So I wanted to be super careful. And then I started looking at the, you know, we started, you know, analyzing the environment and realized that this domain controller wasn't fully patched. I was able to exploit a vulnerability in Kerberos to es escalate to domain administrator on the network, right? I have an authentic, I have a credential, a valid username and password, which this flaw or this uh, exploit required. And then I was able to get to DA. So the first thing I do when I get to domain administrator is I install like a cobalt, a cobalt strike implant, which we call a beacon. So now I have a beacon that's on the domain controller. It's connected back to my C2. And one of the first things we do is what AV are they running? Because the first thing we want to do is, you know, do a little bit of re reconnaissance because in a lot of, you know, a lot of EDRs are really good with post exploitation detection. And in this particular case, they were just using Defender, right? And, uh, and uh, we knew what we could get away with, def with Defender. First thing I did was dump the password hashes using Cobalt Strike because they have a built in um, post exploitation, essentially menu of what you could do. And one of them is running Mimi Cats. So using Mimi Cats, we're able to dump the NTLM hashes in the environment. First thing I do is offload those hashes up and up to three Brutalis machines, and these are eight GPU crackers. So we're talking about 24 GPUs that's hammering against Active Directory, trying so, to crack those NTLM hashes. So Kevin, you you are using well-known tool. 
at the end for crack the password to crack the password? Well, at the end, I, I just use one GPU cracker, mm -hmm. but usually I cluster them together. So I get 500 billion tries a second. But in this particular case, since we were having such success at cracking so many different credentials in this environment, including people that had elevated rights like domain administrator, I was able to tailor it back to one device. And what we're using is we weren't using a tool like John the Ripper, we're using Hashcat, which is one of my favorite tools. And you know, I think it's the most popular tool today to you know, crack credentials. But what's great is remember I told you how their environment was set up, that it was all Mac endpoints in the environment and they used Active Directory to authenticate. So what I wanted to do next is I wanted to, my goal was, was to compromise their AWS cloud environment. So I thought the best way to do it is compromise an endpoint belonging to somebody in DevOps, some developer, somebody that's in IT operations. And how I was able to identify who those individuals were was basically through Active Directory, right? So, you know, I could look at the groups, who's a member of these particular groups. So I found a list of potential targets that were DevOps. I found people that were in IT operations, obviously people that were domain administrator might have privileges in AWS. So what was nice about this environment, Fred, is they use Jamf and Jamf is, you know, an MDN that's used for managing Mac endpoints, right? And so because of that, they left port 22 open on all their endpoints because they weigh, because they had Jamf rather than pulling, they actually, you know, um, rather, I mean, rather than pushing, they were, you know, pulling in uh, Jamf requests. And so they left, you know, SSH open. And so what I simply did is now that I cracked working credentials because I knew that what would work, you know, the credentials I cracked in Active Directory would also work on their endpoint. I was able to SSH into their endpoints. And with these people that had administrator rights, I could sudo, sudo to bash. So what that meant is just elevate to root, didn't need an exploit. So I'm now I'm root on their endpoints. First thing I do is go after their SSH directories and steal their private keys. So I could laterally move in the environment. And fortunately, not many, but some of those actually password protected their private keys, but not all. And I didn't care, as long as I could find one that works, hey, I'm good, I'm golden. Um, the other thing I look for in, you know, typically when you're using the AWS com command line interface, you have a .AWS directory and you might have an AWS access key and secret key stored. And in this environment, I found several. And uh, what it turned out, is how I was able to get to their AWS environment is they had a jump box. I was able to connect to the jump box is using a stolen private key. So now it's in their jump box. And now I was able you know, to connect to certain applications inside the you know, cloud environment. And then of course, I'm able to use the access keys and I was going through each uh, access key to see what privileges I had. And it was like, you know, again, the holy grail, I found an AWS access key that had full administrator access. So then I was able to leverage that in the environment uh, to basically compromise every, everything. So what I did is I simply like on all their critical databases that were in RDS, I basically you know, created a snapshot of those databases and I basically modified the permissions of the snapshot so I could share it with my AWS account. And also on a lot of their critical instances that were used in production, I also did the same thing, snapshotted them, uh, modified the permissions, moved it over into my AWS account. Then I launched all those instances. So I had become almost like a working copy of a part of their environment. So um, uh, pretty much at that time, you know, it's game over guys. Uh, Kevin, quick yeah, question. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's game over. <laughs> just, just a quick question from my side. How big is your AWS environment? Because it sounds to me really big when you copy all the data and all the snapshots from another company to your private account. Should be something huge. Well, I made a huge mistake, guys, a huge underestimation of what it would cost. So I've learned a, a hard lesson. So I got my bill after uh, moving over a lot of their um, instances over into my environment. And I ended up getting a $14,000 bill. So that I had obviously paid to Amazon. So I learned in the future, you gotta be really careful of what you move over to my account. But what was interesting, so I happened to be at the, in the same city where the client was, 
I called the client up. I said, hey, we're still working on the report. It's going to be another week. But I happen to be in town. Do you want me to give you like a verbal update? And the client goes, sure, come by our office. You know, it, you know, actually come by at lunch. We'll have the whole team there. So I show up and they have everybody around this table. And uh, I sit down, you know, get through the introductions. And the CIO uh, steps up. He goes, uh, so, uh, so Kevin, uh, I guess you didn't get in. You know, so um, I, I think we have, a, you know, we have a stuff pretty much locked down in our environment. I said, well, do you want the good news or do you want the bad news first? And then, you know, he got a little bit worried, a little bit of concern on his face. He goes, what's the bad news? He goes, the bad news is I did compromise your environment. I have complete control over your administrator Matt endpoints. I have complete control of your AWS cloud. And I've basically broken into your retail store and compromised all the Macs. And I, have a, I showed him a picture of me lifting up their safe because they had a safe in the retail establishment, but I could actually lift it up and carry it out the door, which I didn't do. But I had a picture of it. And I mean, their, their jaws are dropped. Like, how is this possible? Like, we didn't see anything. No alerts, no anything. And, and the guy stops and he goes, well, what's the good news then? I said, well, the good news is if you guys ever went down, I actually cloned a major portion of your AWS infrastructure over to my AWS account so I could be your backup. You know, kind of as a joke, <laughs> they didn't laugh. But uh, I tried. <laughs> so, I did try, which was it, nice. Awesome. <laughs> so, so a lot of stuff was going on in parallel. As you could see, you know, we're, we're going into the retail store. We're, you know, canvassing the wireless network. We're using all this intelligence in that one goal of getting into their environment and getting to their production databases, which is pretty much end game for this particular client. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So we'll try our best to, 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 to put the things in place with your remarks, of course, to try to make your life a little bit harder, if I may. <laughs> so uh, first of all, um, Jesus, do you want to start with this? Yes, please. If you can share your screen very quickly. Do you uh, see my screen? No. Yes, sir. It's perfect. So, yeah, guys, what, um, what we can do from the, uh, from the uh, uh, blue team perspective, right? So the, the, in terms of prevention, when we are talking about the prevention capabilities within the, the, the Cortex uh, agent, we are talking about, uh, we need to prevent malware, right? And uh, for preventing malware, we, we need a combination of a static analysis and dynamic analysis as well, right? So that means that we are, we are launching uh, malware in the sandboxes, we are analyzing the behavior, we are learning with that, and we are also doing uh, local analysis, static analysis, which can also help be of help in, in some particular cases against uh, 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 even scripts, right? Um, of course, we also need to take care of, of the anti-exploiting, right? Uh, if you remember Kevin's story, and we will summary now very, very quickly, he used a couple of exploits uh, in order to elevate his privileges when he was inside. So for that thing, we need to, to work on the anti-exploited side of the picture besides malware. And um, talking about uh, anti-exploiting means in our case that we are, we, what we are trying to do here, guys, is, uh, is uh, we are targeting the uh, techniques that the attackers need to put in place in order to exploit the vulnerability, right? So do you know that finding a vulnerability is one thing, and understanding that something is potentially exploitable is one thing, and other different stories, how do you exploit it? And for that, the, the attackers need to combine different techniques. For those of you that are more geeks here in the, in the session, like maybe they are making a combination of a rope chain, uh, attack on together with a heap spray or access to some DLL uh, uh, in the case of Windows, which uh, shouldn't be authorized, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what we are detecting, which basically gives us a chance to detect zero day uh, exploits because we are not relying on the, on the CVE or a previous uh, knowledge on, on the exploit itself. Still, for the most complicated attacks, guys, uh, we need to go deeply into the behavior and detection uh, uh, stuff, which basically uh, what we are doing is analyzing uh, the, the behavior and trying to, as we mentioned before, through analytics, detect the leftovers, understand first what are the baselines. And after we understand the baselines uh, over long periods of time, typically two to four weeks to understand what is the normal, trying to understand what are the anomalies. So these are the main, the main stuff on the prevent side. Still, of course, we won't be able to prevent everything, right? This is not possible. So for that reason, uh, we still need to, to take telemetry, to work hard on the detection side. As, as you probably remember, I also mentioned before, guys, talking about also the need to automate all the process. So what basically we are doing here, we have like a, a, a huge data lake uh, in this case where we are retaining 
30 days of data. We are gathering data from everything that you could think of, including network firewalls, endpoints, of course, our own endpoints, cloud stuff that uh, was uh, very, very relevant from Kevin's attack, even endpoints that don't have a connection. We can uh, some, somehow through a kind of proxy uh, gather that information and third party data. And we are keeping all that information for 30 days. And over these data lakes, where we are running our analytics for trying to detect the most complicated attacks. So maybe for it, it's time to, to try to, once that we have summarized our main capabilities very, very quickly, try to put us in front of Kevin's uh, uh, attack chain and, and see what we could do to make his life a bit, a bit more difficult. With pleasure. So if we start from the beginning, which was the uh, famous uh, USB, that uh, the keyloggers that you plug in the Mac, uh, here device control is able to block uh, any kind of device that you will plug in uh, in this kind Even of- the wireless uh, keylogger? Yes. The wireless keylogger too? Okay. Yes. And, right. okay. uh, but uh, as you already shared with us, uh, Kevin, sometimes, you know, this kind of keylogger could, uh, um, could hide their, uh, um, their system behind the keyboard or something else like that. So, of course, we won't block any keyboard. So, if, for, by example, you have something which is really advanced and use something which could emulate the keyboard, the anti-malware will, will be able to block it, certainly. And... The second thing is that even if we could not block it for any reason, the second side of uh, this attack that Kevin explained to us, uh, exploit a CVE. This CVE is a vulnerability on the uh, Mac OS. And one of the things that we are able to do is that with the anti-exploit, we are able to block this kind of attack, of course. The second thing is all these activities that Kevin made on their network where they were able to, um, to look for uh, IP address, IP phone, run a scanner, and a uh, lot of things on their networks. That's something that they are able, that we are able to detect with the behavior analytics because that's not something that should happen on the network usually. Okay, and to finalize it, we have also the multi-factor authentication that we will enable on all our um, next-gen firewall where we would like to have this kind of uh, alert. One thing that we are never able to block, and Kevin, I really, <laughs> I really rely on you on this, that's the physical access to the device. Uh, to be completely honest with you, gentlemen, no one will have the good habit to block Kevin to have access to a physical device. So my recommendation to you is to read the books that you wrote, um, I think that it's 20 years ago, Kevin, called The Heart of Deception, where you have all the good manner and good habit to, to learn to avoid this kind of attack where someone will access physically to your device. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Important. Because the, the bad actor is going to try to figure out, uh, you know, attack methods to use, which you know obviously leave a you know limited footprint. Yeah. Thanks yeah. a lot for that one. So, guys, as you can see, this is a multi-stage uh, defense approach, right? There is not just one magic trick that will stop Kevin for sure. So, the, the next one moving forward, if you remember, once that he got this uh, VPN connection after uh, after getting the credentials without the dual factor authentication uh, he he came back to the to the he was able to to, to jump into the kerberos the domain controller he exploited a, a, a back there so the anti exploiting module that i was talking before would be of help because as i mentioned we are talking about techniques not this particular the cve i still if he was able to bypass that the next thing he did was using uh, cracking the credentials right that he was able to to get here from, with uh, Mimikatz, if I remember correctly, through the, the Cobalt Strike implant. And um, after that, he started to make SSH to the DevOps. This will create uh, definitely an anomaly on, their, on the behavioral analytics team that we have inside Cortex-XDR. And uh, we should be able to detect this kind of anomaly. Still, if uh, this uh, didn't work and we uh, still jump into the, into the cloud, um, we have the, the Prisma Cloud integration there, which is uh, everything that we are running on the, on the cloud. And one of the modules inside this solution, which is uh, the CSPM, right? The Cloud Security Posture Management has also an anomaly detection. So we should be able within Prisma Cloud to detect the, 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 the kind of activities that Kevin was trying to do when he used this ZAMPF box and was trying to clone the, the things, trying to identify abnormal behaviors for the DevOps accounts that he, he was trying to use in order to copy everything. Last but not least, if everything else fails and we are still, uh, if we are still uh, out of the game, we have the telemetry, right? We have the 30 days telemetry that will allow us to get everything on, 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 on time and do a proper investigation and threat hunting. I think Fred at this time now to, to mention also in the last two minutes of the session today, the importance of the people, right? Of the persons, the, the SOC personas. So maybe you wanna take it this one? 
Yes, so the thing which is really important here that you have behind the computer, there is always people. Uh, so depends on the job of the company, you could have a lack of resources, you could have use a security operation center, which will be external. And one of the things which is really important and where the tool will help, that what we call the behavior analytics, as Jesus said, where we will learn on a daily basis what the user usually do. Every morning I turn on my uh, email. Uh, after that, I uh, check my uh, Salesforce or something like that, you know? And if something change from their usual habit, we will uh, take it and use an alert. And sometimes there is also a question of competency. When you have someone like Kevin who try to hack you, you need really to be uh, well prepared. And something, some, sometimes there is low signal attack that you could detect. And that's what the threatened thing is able to do. Detect an attack before that it will happen during the discovery phase. That's something that we should do and we will be able to do. Of course, as Jesus uh, expressed it multiple times, one of the main things for me, which is really important is the automation. The guys who work on the SOC sometimes are really bothered by everything that they should repeat time after time, do it 10 times or even 100 times a day. So everything that we will be able to automate will help them. And by the way, automation is a blocking point from my point of view of social engineering because no one will speak to a bot, you know, <laughs> and try to convince him that you are not the one that you, that you claim to be. And of course, the correlation rule where we will put everything in one context where you will collect the log from everywhere and be able to correlate in one place all, this, all the chains of element, you will have the full chain of an attack or maybe of an incident. Yeah, guys, at the end, the, at the, end the impact that the, the SOC has in, in this zero trust approach that we've been presenting today, trying to make uh, Kevin's life a bit more difficult, is trying to, to create a security strategy that is predictable and repeatable so that uh, there, there, there are no, we are leaving uh, not enough room to improvisation, right? Um, at the end of the day, trying to, to again, to get a, a, a risk reduction, as we were talking before, the attack uh, surface reduction, getting more confidence, higher confidence in the security controls that you are putting in place. And at the end of the day, simplifying the operations through automation to be sure that the people, the good guys that you have at your SOC guide, the guys that are here in this call working on SOC are able to really uh, dedicate your time to the most value tasks that are probably those around threat hunting, right? So at the end of the day, we are talking about removing all these uh, huge amount of alerts, completely disconnected and dispersed, and trying to put what Cortex is trying to do for you guys is trying to, to bring some uh, unification and clarity together with automation. And with that, I think that it's time to give you control back, guys. Thanks a lot. Well, one yeah, minute but... scheduling, so the floor is yours, Kevin. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you. One thing is if you sign up for next month's Ignite 21 virtual event that's happening on November 15th through the 18th, and since you attended this virtual event, you'll be entered into a drawing to win a copy of my autobiography, Ghost in the Wires, which I signed, by the way. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Fred. I really enjoyed being part of your event today. Thanks so much, Kevin. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, everyone, guys. Thank you, Thank you Kevin. Everyone. Have a nice Thank day. You. Thank you to all the audience. Thank oh, you very go and much. rest. It's very late for you. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good rest of the night. Thank you. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.